I say those words and normally I take and I go walking off the platform. So it's different for me tonight, of course for you as well, since I'll be sharing from God's word for you this evening. Of course we'll be praying um, after the um, message tonight. So um, while we're doing that, of course, you can remember um, Pastor and Patty while they're there in Rochester, uh, especially. Uh, so you can uh, pray for them there. So tonight's message uh, is titled, Standing in the Gap. Um, there's a, a Bible that uh, Kaylee got for me. Um, I believe it was for my birthday. I forget if it was for the first or second year um, that I was up here in Minnesota. Um, but it's a black bound, black uh, bound um, Bible, uh, and is engraved in it um, is the um, reference uh, to Ezekiel 22 verses 30 and 31. I mean, those are some passages that we'll be uh, looking at tonight. Um, but it's some, some very potent passages as well. That's standing in the gap. Um, if you turn with me to the book of Ezekiel, it's where we'll start a uh, chapter two. In verses 3 and 5. Ezekiel is a prophet of God uh, to the children of Israel. Of course, the nation of Israel as a whole, um, eventually they took and uh, seriously, they did not follow the Lord, and God judged them for that and took them into captivity. Um, so as long as we Take and follow the Lord. Of course, we're in a different dispensation now. Um, there's consequences when we don't follow the Lord as we should. But in Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 3 and through 5, we see God's call to Ezekiel as a prophet of God. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me, even unto this very day. For they are impu impudent children and stiff-hearted. I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. And they, whether they will hear, or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall, yet shall they know that there hath been a prophet among them. Very potent words um, that is, God is giving to Ezekiel to then give to, of course, the nation of Israel. Um, being a rebellion, when someone is in rebellion, um, they're not willing to hear most times. They're in a state of pride, of selfishness, and someone comes along and tells them um, that they're wrong for what you're doing, um, and whatever the case may be, they're not going to be willing to listen. Uh, yet, God sends Ezekiel anyway. Ezekiel is a prophet of God to the nation of Israel, giving prophecy of coming judgment. Uh, if you study the book of Ezekiel, um, it's both that aspect of an already, not yet. Prophecy of the future and what's coming, even in the last days and what, where we are now. Um, but also of where Israel was at the time and had been. So um, Israel had been judged as a nation um, and having already been captured, um, captured as a nation um, by the nation, um, nation of Babylon, or the, called Chaldeans. But being sent to that rebellious nation, man is by his very nature rebellious, selfish, and prideful. That's how we're born into this world. The human condition by the sin curse um, that's the base point in which we all are born with, um, and it's it's a very difficult um, condition to deal with when you're dealing with people. It doesn't sound too much like a ministry um, one would want to join oneself to, to deal with someone who's rebellious. But God and Ezekiel trusted God, and He was faithful to proclaim. The message God sends to him, um, his words, as we should be faithful to, to tell a rebellious, word, a rebellious world. God is seeking for his individual believer priests, his ambassadors, to do exactly what Ezekiel was sent to do. True born-again Christians as believer priests 
you see in the book of Ephesians, as a, in a, the New Dispensation there, one of Paul's epistles, uh, specifically chapter 4, is where it gives the vocational call of a believer priest. But in that grand scope of things, looking at the book of Ephesians, the call of what uh, a true born-again individual should be doing, how to operate um, in the world, having fellowship with the Lord, um, and how to engage the world, um, having been perfected for the work of the ministry. Jesus as our great high priest, representing us before the Father, and we stand complete in him because of the sacrifice um, that he has provided himself for paying God's wrath on the cross. We thus, complete in him, represent God to the world through the power of the Holy Spirit to see men born again and discipled to God's glory, not to our own. So, again, as Ezekiel was sent to the rebellious nation of Israel, God sends the church, made up of his individual believer priests, to a rebellious world. And indeed, it is a rebellious world. As we move closer and closer to um, the last days, and then the church is removed. Time and time again, judgment, of course, is being poured out in the world. And it's said in the book of Revelation, and they repenteth not. They harden their hearts. They do not repent. They do not repent. God still in all of that wrath has his arm outstretched, his hand outstretched to them. And it's said that um, by sands as the number of the sea are born again, even when his wrath is being poured out on the world. We need to be faithful in proclaiming the words of God. So the church has been sent to the world with the gospel. We're learning, learning a lot about the gospel as we progress in, um, from Sunday to Sunday in the, in the messages pastors preaching on. So as generations pass, the faith, God's word, we have it right here with us today. It has to pass from generation to generation. We can't just stick it on a shelf and think that it's going to pass when we pass. We have to be active on engaging the world with it. Passages I'm reminded of um, in 2 Timothy, um, and I'll read those for you here. Um, a lot of times, Christianity today, and I say that in general because Chris, you use the word Christianity, um, and that's a vague term because it has become so much of a mixing pot when people say Christian because they're referring to Catholicism, um, Lutherans, um, Presbyterians, Methodists. They're just lumping everyone in to the same pot, but they're those who are not following God's word, the true um, teachings of Christ. But verses here from 2 Timothy chapter 2 um, speak to this in the sense of the faith, I mean, things of uh, God's word. Paul speaking to Timothy in chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 4. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men. And that can all, that's also women, because as believer priests, um, they need to be faithful as well. This, of course, is speaking to Timothy as being a pastor, passing on the faith in the sense of men who will be able to train pastors. Um, so in principle, this also references um, a believer priest. But the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. There's that discipleship. Thou therefore endure hardness. If you're going to be teaching, sharing the gospel, discipling, a rebellious world, you're going to be enduring hardship. Life is hard. Ministry, especially as a Christian, is hard. It's no cakewalk. But endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. With all the world in upheaval, especially with all eyes over in Europe on Ukraine, a lot of talk is on soldiers 
citizen soldiers and such, and they're enduring hardness as soldiers. The hardness here as a good soldier, though, is spiritual warfare is something entirely different than physical warfare um, because physical warfare can only end in death um, and then you enter into eternity having have made one of two choices whether you um, enter into God's presence in eternity um, being complete in him to spend eternity with him or having not been born again you spend eternity separated unto him and await then the great white throne judgment um, at the end uh, of the world. That's a little rabbit trail there. But we're supposed to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, passing on the faith um, down through the generations. For the nation of Israel, they reverted time and time again into idolatry, idolatry those things which were not um, godly, away from their worship and faith in the Lord. The Lord, meaning Jehovah, saves. They were not faithful in uh, following the ways of teaching, uh, proclaiming the gospel as given in the Old Testament, which is the same as we're given now. Everyone is saved the same way, by grace, through faith. It is no different. But seeing as they abandoned the ways of the Lord and the precepts, that they were supposed to hold to, God judged them for it by surrounding nations to oppress them. And eventually, then they were uh, judged by being led captive to um, by Assyria um, by, for the northern tribes. And then eventually, uh, the Ch Chaldeans conquered Assyria and then Judah. And on all of those things in which scripture um, speaks to. God needs faithful men and women to be his representatives before the world, before him. Are we going to stand in the gap? It's important, very important. Now we come to those verses I was referring to in Ezekiel chapter 22, verses 30 and 31. With all of these things going on, Ezekiel, I mean, and read the book of Ezekiel, um, to, um, it's very important to know aspects of prophecy, the end times, um, and what's going on. God will, we will give account as an individual to how we have discerned God's word, how we are understanding uh, these things. Um, but read the book of Ezekiel so you will know what's going on uh, today in God's, in the world. But the verses here in Ezekiel chapter 22, verses 30 and 31. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Therefore have I poured out mine indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we thank you so much for your word. I pray that you will help us strive to, as we um, go through it tonight, as I um, comment on it, that the uh, power of your Holy Spirit will um, reveal through me, and that those gleaning will open your heart, their heart to the word, um, and that we would all strive to be perfected by your word for the work of the ministry. I pray that uh, we will always strive to give you glory and honor in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. So God is seeking for a man among them to stand in the gap. This is specifically spoken to men, but it can also apply to women in principle, since we are in this age of uh, grace dispensation. As all born-again individuals, men and women, we're ambassadors and representatives of Christ, and we represent God to the world. There are five key things or points that I want to reveal here um, in verse 30. And I sought, and it's pretty plain on how God's word speaks to it, but, and I sought, make up the hedge, and stand in the gap, but I found none. 
So there's very specific things that when you take and dig down into God's word, it will reveal to you what God is trying to say. And I sought to search out by any method, by any method, to strive after, to ask, to beg, beseech, desire. God is desiring and he's seeking for a man to stand in the gap. Make up the hedge to wall in, to close up, to fence up, to repair a wall. So an enclosure, you think of a, a walled city. God is seeking for someone to stand in the gap. He is seeking for someone to repair a broken down wall that's fallen into ruin for something that has not been walled and has the um, foundation of scripture, doctrine, um, those things which are of salvation, those boundaries that God's word gives us. God is seeking for someone to stand in the gap and build up those walls. Are we going to stand in the gap and do that? And stand to abide, continue, dwell, endure, remain, and serve. Do you want to abide in the gap? There's going to be a lot of onslaught when you're taking and standing against the onslaught of satanic attack. This is spiritual warfare that we're referring to here. In the gap, a break or a breach. This isn't that's just some tiny little gap that we're talking about when you make a, a cut um, for um, construction or a gap between um, tile or whatever it may be, because that's what most people think about nowadays when they think about the word gap. But a breach um, or a break um, in history and biblical times, you think of fenced and walled cities. Um, these are massive walls. These are massive cities that have built these defenses, and this is a huge break. This is a huge opening that is needing someone to repair, to stand in the gap for defense. It is no easy task, but I found none. None appeared to exist. There was no one to stand in the gap because there was, he couldn't find anyone to repair, to, to fill the gap, to stand there, to fill the breach. Because of those things, therefore, because of their consequences, what they did, their actions, their behaviors, as it said there in verse 31, I've poured out my indignation on them. I've consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed. I've rewarded them according to their works, which were evil upon their own heads, saith the Lord God. God is, will reward us for our works ultimately in eternity. God judges nations in time, and souls in eternity. But why would God have to be searching for men to be his representatives before the people. Shouldn't there be someone already there to be the representative? It reminds me of Abraham's conversation with God concerning Sodom and Gomorrah um, in Genesis um, 18. And I'm going to read that conversation for you in Genesis chapter 18. Uh, it's it's an amazing conversation. Previously to that, you can see the angels who end up going to uh, pull Lot and his family um, out of um, Sodom, basically against his will. Um, the angels were sent on ahead to do God's um, will there. But God took and had this conversation with Abraham, and it's very telling on how we, as a representative of Christ, need to have both boundaries and also how we need to be proclaiming the truth um, 
because it, it matters for eternity. Genesis 18, 25 through 33. So this is Abraham speaking right here. Actually, I'm going to back up a few verses to 23. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. And Abraham answered and said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Abraham, with great fear and reverence, is pleading with the Lord, the Lord who is Jehovah saves, that is, who he is. He did not want to judge Sodom and Gomorrah and to have these individuals destroyed, but because of what they had done, he was rewarding them according to what they um, have done. But he spake unto him yet again, Peradventure there shall be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for forty's sake. And he said unto him, O let it not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Peradventure there shall thirty be found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Peradventure there shall be twenty found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. And he said, O let the Lord not be angry, and I will speak yet but this once. Peradventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left continuing or communing with Abraham. And Abraham returned unto his place. Of course, we all, I say we all, some do not know the account of that. There were not even ten found in Sodom and Gomorrah. And judgment fell on that place and destroyed them. God is seeking for individuals to stand in the gap for the land. Now, again, ultimately, it's up to the, each individual to be born again, and then God will judge them according to their works um, here in time and in eternity. But as a born-again individual, God has given us the responsibility to go and tell how to operate as a Christian. Where are the men and women that should make up the hedge to build and repair the wall? No wall is being built or repaired. The wall of pers personal holiness unto the Lord, not unto men, because there is a difference. Because you can have individuals who are puffing themselves up, being prideful, and being self righteous, and being legalistic. Um, or you can have individuals who are striving simply, surrendering their lives to the Lord, striving to live holy and separated unto him, and then being labeled as um, legalistics and pharisaical. But that wall of personal holiness unto the Lord has fallen into ruin and rubble. In 1 Corinthians 3, 10 and 13, um, we find some... Um, very crucial, crucial, I'll get the words out there, passages, 10 and through 13, it speaks to aspects of personal holiness, but on a foundation. So second, or 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 10 through 13. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, 
Every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. God is seeking and desiring his believer priest to be surrendered to him, to be used in ministry before him. That's what it means to stand in the gap before him for the land. The foundation spoken of here is the foundation of salvation. Because you can't build upon precepts in God's word of holiness until you start with salvation. Because that's just going to be works. The do's and don'ts. And that's not um, Christianity. That's not a born-again individual. The foundation spoken of being salvation should always then afterwards follow things that are spiritual, eternal, not worldly, that are temporal. God desires that as believer priests grow um, and are surrendered to him, that as if they fall and they um, take and fall into carnal um, aspects into the old man, that they repair their wall of fellowship before him. And that's repentance, asking God for forgiveness of sins. Recall that many times Israel would fall away from the Lord. He would judge them. Think of even now with the new dispensation, when um, we take and as a born-again individual, um, we are carnal, we are um, living in sin, God chastises his children to bring them back um, to him. But Israel would return after judgment. They'd repent and return. But in Israel's case, they would then um, go back after a short time. And that was their decision. To have a unified relationship with God for ministry will bring blessing on the desired ministry. To stand in the gap before God is to see souls saved and born again. To be a bulwark against the world for his glory. The faith, contend, uh, the faith contended for against false doctrine. If you're going to stand in the gap, you have to do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. And you can't do it on your own. Um, by no means can we do it in the power of the flesh because it will fail every single time. Because when we stand, when we abide, when we dwell and endure in one spot, um, you're going to have those fiery darts. All of those attacks come right at you. If you're in a stand, in a breach, there's not much room to move. And you can't retreat. You need to stand. Because if you retreat, if you take and abandon the gap, who is left to stand in the gap? Unless someone else desires to be there, no one will be found to be there. The book of Ephesians, again, it's a detailed explanation of the vocational call of the believer priest, a true individual who's born again. So having sought for a man to repair that wall of protection, God seeks for him to stand in the gap. But it's not just any gap. You can go and build your own wall over here, your own, um, stand in your own gap, and in this direction over here, and you can never see God work. You need to stand in a particular gap where God desires you to be working. Um, you can't, um, you need to be in God's word, you need to be, um, in prayer, um, and as you're serving the Lord, surrender to him, um, God will show you where you need to be. It's not just you out um, directing your own steps, um, thinking that you're serving the Lord. And does that mean that anything we are doing is not serving the Lord? Well, no, not necessarily. We just need to be careful that anything we do in the flesh is worthless. It must be always of the Spirit. Remember, if you truly desire to stand in the gap, it's soon going to be apparent that you're in the right gap. Because you're going to be attacked for your stand. 
That's where those verses from 1 Timothy ring true, because you're going to be having to endure hardness by attacks, uh, personal attacks, satanic attacks, because of your stand for righteousness. To endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. We'll need to be properly equipped. Be mature and be maturing. It is not just a one-time experience. It's an experiencing. experiencing. <laughs> You're gaining experience. We're always striving for the mark. We won't reach the full mark until we are glorified. That's the perfection that we're striving for in this world. And that's why we're matured for the work of the ministry. So it's not necessarily good for new Christians to stand in the gap. Solidification in God's doctrine, his word and resilience to, onslaught, to the onslaught of satanic attack is not necessarily someone who is weak in the faith to be. You need to be, as I've heard it said, um, I forget how they said, said it. Is it studied up and prayed up? I think that's how the statement goes. But you need to definitely make sure that you are fully dependent on the Lord when you're desiring to serve him. And I wouldn't think, why would we not be desiring to serve him? not just be living our own lives and doing our own, living our own way. We should always strive to be serving the Lord. Does that mean there's absolutely no one out there if we're not in the gap? No. God said, and Jesus himself said, that the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. And the reality is that there's always a faithful remnant that's sounding out the truth, and that's standing in the gap. But yet, sadly, that remnant is small. Satan will always leave the world alone because they're not saved. He doesn't have to worry about them. He'll leave the carnal Christian alone to a point because they're acting like the world and being a bad testimony to the name of Christ. Satan will attack Christians who are seeking to make God their head and priority and who are seeking to win souls to Christ and be discipled. They're standing in the gap for the land. They don't want to see it destroyed. I would hope that be my desire, um, as revealed in God's word. Ultimately, that's what's going to happen. But the desire is that we see souls born again and discipled for God's glory. It's why the book of Ephesians details of how we're to operate as a born-again Christian. And not just the book of Ephesians, God's word tells us how to operate as a born-again individual. Will you turn with me there to the book of Ephesians? Chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. Here's this synopsis um, of what all has been said previously for the book of Ephesians, of what Paul is speaking to the Ephesians about, um, on how they're supposed to be operating as a believer priest. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, not in yourself, not in someone else, who perhaps is even someone you may look up to as a stronger Christian. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye be able to that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, 
taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Yes, this means you and I personally have to put ourselves at risk. We do so at many other things in this world when we put ourselves at risk. Why can't we do it for the Lord? When it matters so much more for eternity, I would hope that I would make the personal decision um, to follow after him um, when I do these things. Um, and I encourage you also um, to do the same. It comes back and it rings true into the verses. God is searching for men and women to stand in the gap. Let him find you in the gap. God's word tells us to be sober and to be found watching. There's other verses, I believe in Revelation, where it talks about a servant needing to be found watching when the Lord comes to return. So with, with that all being said, I'll leave you with the verses from Ezekiel. 22 verses 30 and 31. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. May it be that if God is seeking for someone to stand in the gap, put your name there, that he finds your name there, that I find Daniel standing in the gap before him for the land, and that he doesn't find anyone not present in that gap. So I'll, that's all that I have for you tonight. But that doesn't mean since I'm done tonight that you can't take and as you go home, continue in your own studies, in your own personal discipleship. So I thank you coming here tonight uh, for our study. I'll close in prayer and then we can take some prayer requests. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your study of your word. We thank you for um, the, the book of Ezekiel, uh, the admonition that it has for us. Um, the encouragements that it has for us to um, be able to see uh, where we need to be uh, as a Christian. Um, I pray that you'll help us see how we need to be as a testimony in the world for you, and that we should str always strive to be discerning of your word, um, and always strive to do um, it in the power of your spirit, not of the flesh, uh, having um, the knowledge and the power, of, of course, of uh, in your wisdom. I pray that you'll help us as we proclaim the gospel in the world, um, that we see souls born again, we see them discipled, um, and that we see as many people um, do that as possible, seeing that the days are short, uh, and that we warn them to flee the wrath to come. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Of course, remember...